Hi everyone. Uh, we continue through 1 Peter today, uh, working through uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 12 to chapter 3 verse 12. And we're looking at a really interesting piece of scripture. Uh, I've been anticipating this week's study for some time. Um, it includes some discussion around marriage and men and women, which is the topic of much interest, uh, particularly within the evangelical church at the moment. Uh, please make sure that you have actually read the scripture before listening to this. Um, I'm not going to go through it verse by verse and we'll be talking as if you are familiar with what is there. So a bit like a teenager, I rushed with a level of naivety into my preparation for this message, uh, ready to pull out some practical life lessons from the three categories uh, of submission that are being discussed. But as I read uh, and thought and let the passage speak, I found myself quickly unstuck. Uh, Peter zeroes in on three scenarios that challenged the first century church. Roman rule, slavery, and marriages between uh, Christian and non-Christian believers. So no problem, I thought. We'll just swap in the prime minister for the Roman emperor, uh, your boss, uh, for slave master and marriage is marriage, so that one will be easy. <laughs> I've, been, um, I've been reading through this genre of Christian literature lately, which tracks the shaping impact of Christian faith on the Western world. There have been a couple of books written in the last um, couple of years, and it's been fascinating and very helpful for shattering my own complacency about the beauty and the potency of Jesus' impact on the world that we know today. And part and parcel of that awakening uh, has been some exposure to the stories and descriptions of what Peter's audience would have considered the status quo. For us living in this distinctly Christianized society today, uh, we so easily assume that things have always been much as they are today and that people have always thought the same and acted the same. But su suffice to say that is not true. It's not even remotely true. And it is therefore a stretch to suggest that swapping in a democratically elected, personally accountable four-year term prime minister, Anthony Albanese, uh, in place of a a deified supreme Roman emperor uh, is ever going to be a meaningful comparison. <laughs> now, as with all scripture, we can view it from different facets, uh, and together with other passages on a topic, it can be illuminating uh, for different reasons. And so we may come back to this passage in, in time to come, in years to come, uh, with another lens. But on this round, I believe the Spirit has pointed me in a, a certain direction. Um, reading through a commentary on this passage by a lady called Mary Wilson, uh, who I believe delivered the original message at a Gospel Coalition conference, she points out that Peter's examples represent some of the most vulnerable groups within the early church. Uh, he doesn't raise the issue of people who might have been employed by non-Christian um, bosses of which there would have been some, nor of soldiers who would be under the command of a non-Christian general, for instance. And so I want to set the scene for the situation on the ground, um, firstly from this book, The Air We Breathe, from, by Glenn Scrivener, and then an excerpt from a book written by Tom Holland called Dominion. He's recounting a story from uh, AD 61. It says, A Roman senator was killed by one of his slaves. Custom dictated that every slave in the household, all 400 of them, must be crucified. Some in Rome objected, said Tacitus, and, quote, shrank from extreme rigor in carrying out the sentence, but the majority in the Senate agreed with Cassius Caius who spoke powerfully in favor of the mass execution. Quite obviously to Caius, tradition was to trump any feelings of pity. And he asked, 
Is it your pleasure to search for arguments in a matter already weighed in the deliberations of wiser men than ourselves? The ancients had spoken. Who were moderns to object? Against those who worry that some innocents may die, some, Caius argued, well, there is some injustice in every great precedent, which, though injurious to individuals, has its compensation in the public advantage. And so such arguments carried the day, and 400 men, women, and children were dragged to 400 crosses, crucified. Thus was the that was upheld the wisdom of the ancients, the greater good of the empire, and the terrorizing of the masses. Deterrence was the goal, and crucifixion a major tool. Sometimes the injustice of it all was the very point being made. To see the slave's punishment inflicted publicly on sometimes hundreds of unwashed masses, even innocents, was to see their worthlessness in the starkest terms. This is a quote from a Roman senator or speaker. The powers that be killed those people because they could, and the more they butchered them, the more they felt able to butcher them. As one victim of Roman brutality said, our torturers were commanded to think and act as if we no longer existed. To see someone crucified was to watch their unpersoning and to hear the message, do not go the way of this wretch. And then a second quote from Tom Holland's book, which is actually referenced in this book by Glenn Scrivener. But I'm going to read it here because it's just easier. So Tom Holland writes uh, on the topic of sexuality and on the issues of consent uh, in, uh, by Roman men. It says, sex was nothing if not an exercise of power. As captured cities were to the swords of the legion, so the bodies of those used sexually were to the Roman man. To be penetrated, male or female, was to be branded as inferior, to be marked as womanish, barbarian or servile. In Rome, men no more hesitated to use slaves and prostitutes to relieve themselves of their sexual needs than they did to use the side of a road as a toilet. In Latin, the same word, meo, meant both ejaculate and urinate. And so, yeah, I've, I, um, I hope I've shocked you with those anecdotes. Uh, but I'm not even scraping the surface um, of these stories. And um, whole books have been written about, about on this topic. Um, and if you want to borrow them from me, you can. But against that backdrop, those stories we read from Peter in chapter 2, 13. Be subject to the Lord, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. And writing to wives with non-Christian husbands, counseling them, he says, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. And so the teaching is a, it's appalling. These are groups of people that Peter is writing to who are subject to the worst of humanity. And they're powerless. Their very bodies are at the mercy of the violent and abusers. And the more you read, the more horrifying it becomes. And the more appalling and unpreachable a message of practical life lessons is possible. And so as, as the stories and the images from this period begin to kind of burn my retina, and my expectant posture, beginning to prepare the message, started to kind of fold in on itself. And the weight of Peter's words and the feebleness of my own faith start to kind of press down on me and my eyes close. And then, a bit like one of those optical illusions where you, you look at a white image and then you close your eyes. And then you see in the darkness 
another picture start the reverse, start to fade into light. I, I just have this image of, of a, a face, and it's it's Jesus' face. The sort of the horror and the the terror of these stories kind of burns into your retina. But as you close your eyes, what you see. The 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 opposite of it um, is Jesus. Jesus' face comes to to my mind. You see, Jesus was perfect, the perfect God. He descends to our world and then he stands before governors and authorities. And he says nothing with no defense. He's perfectly obedient to God. Then he's tortured and he's shamed on his way to death on the cross, murdered on the cross. And you feel the weight of it when moments before his arrest, Jesus prays, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The story of the vulnerable and the slave and the isolated, the endangered wife, is Jesus' story. Verse 22 in this passage, Peter says, He committed no sin, neither was the seat found in his mouth. He was reviled, but he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And so I'm, I'm really aware that when we read these passages, passages like this, even as those who know the love of God in our hearts, uh, we often first look for insight into what our rights and privileges might be. So, what am I entitled to as a husband, or as a wife, or as a citizen, or as an employee? What are my rights? What does God say is mine? But what we mustn't miss from the story is the savagery of sin that we've been saved from. And the shocking injustice of Jesus' sacrifice that's brought us from darkness to light. The submission of Jesus to the corrupt and the violent and the abuser so that we could return to the shepherd and overseer of our souls safe forever. And so, like burdened with that truth, I believe God will give us much grace as we pray for the officials leading our government or for frustrating colleagues or for wayward husbands and wives or your angry neighbor or anyone who has deprived you of justice. Let's not expect to look for simple dead rules to follow from the living stone that we are being built around. Jesus recognized our humanity and his grace towered over it. I want to close reading chapter 2 verse 12 with some mild paraphrasing. It says, keep your conduct among the elected officials, colleagues, spouse, family members. Keep it honorable amongst them. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and they would glorify God on the day of visitation. So stay humble as you read these passages. Remember what has been paid for your security and trust that the Spirit's going to guide you in your relationships and in moments of conflict. Um, where you feel like you've suffered an injustice. Amen, and um, it'll be good to chat about these soon. Cheers.